The men were dressed in rags. Sharp crossed to the two sick men. He crouched and looked to their faces. They were white and shivering, the pulse beat almost gone. He turned to the others. Who are you? Corporal Moss, sir. The man had a fortnight's growth of beard and his cheeks were sunken. They'd obviously not been eating. This is Private Ibbotson. He pointed to his companion. And those are Privates Campbell and Trapper, sir. Moss was being punctilious and polite as though it could save him from his fate. Dust lay heavy in the air. The room was filled with the stench of illness and ordure. Why are you in Oropesa? Came to rejoin the regiment, sir, Moss said, but it was said too quickly. There was silence. Ibbotson sat by the dead fire and stared at the ground between his knees. He was the only one with a weapon, a bayonet held in his left hand, and Sharp guessed that he did not approve of what was happening. Where are your weapons? Lost them, sir. And the uniforms. Moss was eager to please. You mean you sold them? Moss shrugged. Yes, sir. And you drank away the money? Yes, sir. There was a sudden noise in the next room and Sharp whirled to face the doorway. There was nothing there. Moss shook his head. Rats, sir. Bloody armies of them. Sharp looked back to the deserters. Ibbotson was now staring at him, the frightening stare of a crazed fanatic. For a moment, Sharp wondered if he was planning to use the bayonet. What are you doing here, Ibbotson? You don't want to rejoin the regiment? The man said nothing. Instead, he lifted his right arm that had been hidden behind his body. There was no hand, just a stump wrapped in blood-soaked rags. Ib's got in a fight, sir, Moss said. Lost his hand. He's no use to anyone no more, sir. He's right-handed, you see. He added lamely. You mean he's no use to the French? There was silence. The dust hung thick in the air. That's right. Ibbotson had spoken. He had an educated voice. Moss tried to quieten him, but Ibbotson ignored the corporal. We would have been with the French a week ago, but these fools decided to drink. Sharp stared at him. It was strange to hear a cultured voice coming from the rags, stubble, and blood-soaked bandages. The man was ill. He probably had gangrene, but it hardly mattered now. By admitting they were running towards the enemy, Ibbotson had condemned all four. If they'd been caught trying to get to a neutral country, they might have been sent, as Sharp might be, to the garrison in the West Indies, where the fever would kill them anyway. But there was only one punishment for men who deserted to the enemy. Corporal Moss knew it. He looked up at Sharp and pleaded, Honest, sir, we didn't know what we was doing. We waited here, sir. Shut your teeth, Moss. Ibbotson glared at him, then turned to Sharp. His hand moved the bayonet higher, but it was only to emphasize his remarks. We're going to lose this war. Any fool can see that. There are more French armies than Britain could raise in a hundred years. Look at you. His voice was filled with scorn. You might beat one general, then another, but they'll keep coming and they'll win. And you know why? Because they have an idea. It's called freedom and justice, and equality. He stopped abruptly, his eyes blazing. What are you, Ibbotson? Sharp asked. A man. Sharp smiled at the dramatic challenge in the answer. The argument wasn't new. Rifleman tongue could be relied on to trot it out most nights, but Sharp was curious why an educated man like Ibbotson should be in the ranks of the army and preaching the French shibboleths of freedom. You're educated, Ibbotson. Where are you from? Ibbotson did not answer. He stared at Sharp, clutching his bayonet. There was silence. Behind him, Sharp heard Harper and Peters shuffling their feet on the hard earth floor. Moss cleared his throat and beckoned at Ibbotson. He's a vicar's son, sir. He said it as if it explained everything. Sharp looked at Ibbotson. The son of a vicarage? Perhaps the father had died or the family was too large and penury could lie at the end of both those roads. But what fate had driven Ibbotson to join the army? To pit his puny strength against the drunks and hardened criminals who were the usual scrapings gathered by the recruiting parties? Ibbotson stared back at him and then, to Sharp's disgust, began to cry. 
He let go of the bayonet and buried his face in the crook of his left elbow, and Sharp wondered if he were suddenly thinking of a vicarage garden beside a church and a long-lost mother baking bread in the ripeness of an English summer. He turned to Harper. They're under arrest, Sergeant. You'll have to carry those, too. He stepped outside the hovel into the fetid alleyway. Kirby, sir, you can go. The man ran off. Sharp did not want him to face the four deserters whose arrest he had caused. You others, inside. He stared up between the narrowing walls at the patch of sky. Swallows flashed across the opening. The colours were deepening into night, and tomorrow there would be executions. But first, there was Josephina. Harper came to the door. We are ready, sir. Then let's go. Chapter 13 Sharp woke with a start, sat up, instinctively reached for a weapon, and then realising where he was, sank back on the pillow. He was covered with sweat, though the night was cool and a small breeze stirred the edges of the curtains either side of the open window, through which he could see a full moon. Josephina sat beside the bed watching him, a glass of wine in her hand. You were dreaming. Yes. What about? My first battle. He did not say any more, but in his dream he'd been unable to load the brown bess. The bayonet would not fit the muzzle, and the French kept coming and laughing at the frightened boy on the wet plains of Flanders. Boxtel, it had been called, and he really thought of the messy fight in the damp field. He looked at the girl. What about you? He patted the bed. Why are you up? She shrugged. I couldn't sleep. She'd put on some kind of dark robe, but only her face and the hand holding the glass were visible in the unlit room. Why couldn't you sleep? I was thinking about what you said. It may not happen. She smiled at him. No. Somewhere in the town a dog barked, but there were no other sounds. Sharp thought of the prisoners and wondered if they were spending their last night awake and listening to the same dog. He thought back to the evening after he'd come back from the guardroom and the long conversation with Josefina. She wanted to reach Madrid, was desperate to reach Madrid, and Sharp had told her he thought it unlikely that the Allies would get as far as Spain's capital. Sharp thought that Josefina had little idea why she wanted to reach Madrid. It was the dream city for her, the pot of gold at the end of a fading rainbow. And he was jealous of her desire to get there. Why not go back to Lisbon? My husband's family won't welcome me, not now. Ah, Edward. Duarte. Her correction was automatic. Then go home. They'd had this conversation before. He tried to force her to reject every option but staying near him, as though he thought he could afford to keep her. Home? You don't understand. They will force me to wait for him just like his parents do. In a convent or in a dark room, it... Doesn't matter. Her voice was edged with despair. She'd been brought up in Oporto, the daughter of a merchant who was rich enough to mix with the important English families in the town, who dominated the port trade. She'd learned English as a child because that language was the tongue of the wealthy and powerful in her hometown. Then she'd married Duarte, ten years her senior, and keeper of the King's Falcons in Lisbon. It was a courtier's job, far from any falcons, and she'd loved the glitter of the palace, the balls, the fashionable life. Then two years before, when the royal family had fled to Brazil, Duarte had taken a mistress instead of his wife, and she'd been left in the big house with his parents and sisters. He wanted me to go into a convent. Can you believe that? That I should wait for him in a convent, a dutiful wife, while he fathers bastards on that woman? Sharp rolled off the bed and walked to the window. He leaned on the black ironwork, oblivious of his nakedness, and stared towards the east as if, in the night sky, he might see the reflection of the French fires. They were there, a long day's march away, but there was nothing to be seen except the moonlight on the countryside and the falling roofs of the town. Josephina came and stood beside him and ran her fingers down the scars on his back. What happens tomorrow? Sharp turned and looked down on her. They get shot. It's quick. Yes. 
There was no point in telling her of the times when the bullets missed and the officers had to walk up and blow their heads apart with a pistol. He put an arm round her and drew her to him, smelling her hair as she rested her head on his chest, her fingers still exploring the scars. I'm frightened. Her voice was very small. Of them? Yes. Gibbons and Berry had been in the guardroom when the deserters had been brought in. Sir Henry was there, rubbing his hands, and in his delight at the capture of the fugitives, had effusively thanked Sharp, all enmity suddenly put aside. The court-martial was a formality, a matter of moments, and then the paper had gone to be signed by the general and the fate of the four men sealed. Sharp, for a few moments, had been left in the room with the two lieutenants, but nothing had been said to him. They had talked quietly, occasionally laughing, looking at him as if to provoke his anger, but it was the wrong time and place. It would come. He tilted her face towards him. Would you need me if they were not here? She nodded. You still don't understand. I'm a married woman and I've run away. Oh, I know he's done worse, but that does not count against him. The day I left Tuarte's parents, I became alone, do you see? I can't go back there. My parents will not forgive me. I thought in Madrid. She tailed away. And Christian Gibbons said he'd look after you in Madrid. She nodded again. Other girls went, you know that? There are so many officers. But now... She stopped again. He knew what she was thinking. Now you're worried. No Madrid, and you're with someone who has no money, and you're thinking of all those nights in the fields or flea-ridden cottages. She smiled up at him, and Sharp felt the pang of her beauty. One day, Richard, you'll be a colonel with a big horse and lots of money, and you'll be horrible to all the captains and lieutenants. He laughed. But not quickly enough for you. He'd spoken the truth, he knew, but it did not help her. There were other girls, girls of good family like Josefina, who had risked everything to run to the soldiers, but they had been unmarried and had found refuge in a fast wedding, and their families had been forced to make the best of it. But Josefina? Sharp knew she would find a man richer than he, a cavalry officer with money to spare and an eye for a woman, and her affection for Sharp would be overridden by the need for comfort and security. He pulled her very tight to his chest, feeling the night air chill on his skin. I'll look after you. Promise? Her voice was muffled. I promise. Then I won't be frightened. She pulled slightly away. You're cold. It doesn't matter. Come on. She led him back into the dark room. He knew that she was his for a short time and only a short time, and he was saddened by it. Outside, the dog barked on at the empty sky. Chapter 14 The battalion paraded in companies, forming three sides of a hollow square. The fourth side, instead of the accustomed flogging triangle, was made up of two leaning poplar trees that grew beside a shallow pool. The fringes of the pond had been trampled by cavalry, and the mud had dried ochre lumps streaked with green scum. Between the trees lay the battalion's bass drum, and on its grey, stretched skin there rested an open Bible and prayer book. There was no wind to stir the pages, just the sun continuing its relentless assault on the plain and on the men who sweated at attention in full uniform. Sharp stood before the light company at the left of the line and stared over the heads of the grenadier company opposite at the castle of Oropesa. It dominated the plain for miles, its curtain walls rising like stone slabs above the roofs of the town, and Sharp wondered idly what it must have been like to ride in full knightly armour in the days when the castle was a real obstacle. Today's modern siege artillery would punch through the seemingly solid walls and bring the stones tumbling into the steep streets in devastating avalanches. Sweat stung his eyes, dripped onto his green jacket, trickled down his spine. He felt curiously light-headed, not at all a fit state to watch deserters blown into eternity. And as he stared at the castle, he thought of Josefina, and somehow, in the morning light, the bargain did not seem such a bad one. She was his for as long as she needed him, but in return, 
she offered him her happiness and vivacity. And when the arrangement ends? A good soldier, he knew, always planned for the battle after the one ahead, but he could make no plans for the moment when Josefina would take herself away. He looked at Gibbons, who paraded on his horse with the light company. Simerson was mounted in the centre of the square next to General Daddy Hill, who with his staff had come to fulfil his duty of watching execution done. Gibbons sat stony-faced and stared straight ahead. As soon as this parade was done, Sharp knew he would return to the safety of his uncle's side, and the lieutenant had spoken no word to Sharp, just ridden his horse over to the company, turned it and sat still. There was no need for words. Sharp could feel the hatred almost radiating from the man, the determination for revenge, for Sharp had not only gained the promotion Gibbons wanted, but worse than that, the rifleman had the girl too. Sharp knew the matter was unresolved. Fourteen men, all guilty of minor crimes, marched into the square and were stood facing the trees. Their punishment was to act as the firing squad, and as the men stood there, their muskets grounded. They stared with fascination at the two newly dug graves and the crude wooden coffins that waited for Ibbotson and Moss. The other two prisoners had died in the night. Sharp half wondered whether Parton, the battalion's doctor, had helped them on their way, rather than force the battalion to watch two desperately sick men lashed to the trees and shot to pieces. Sharp had seen many executions. As a child, he'd watched a public hanging and listened to the excitement of the crowd as the victims jerked and twitched on the gallows. He'd seen men blown from the muzzles of decorated brass cannon, their bodies shredded into the Indian landscape. He'd watched comrades tortured by the Tipu's women, fed to wild beasts. He had hung men by a casual roadside himself. Yet most often he had seen men shot in the full panoply of ritual execution. He'd never enjoyed the spectacle. He supposed no sensible man did, but he knew it was necessary. Somehow this execution was subtly different. It was not that Moss and Ibbotson did not deserve to die. They had deserted, planned to join the enemy and there could be no end for them other than the firing squad, yet coming on top of the fight at the bridge, coming on top of Simerson's floggings, his repeated condemnation of his men for losing the colour, the execution was seen by the battalion as summing up Simerson's contempt and hatred for them. Sharp had rarely felt such sullen resentment from any troops. In the distance, threading its way through the crowds of British and Spanish spectators, the Provost Marshal's party appeared, prisoners and guard. Forrest walked his horse forward of Simerson. Talion, fix bayonets! Blades scraped out of scabbards and steel rippled round the ranks of the companies. The men must die with due ceremony. Sharp watched Gibbons bend down to talk to the sixteen-year-old Ensign Denny. Your first execution, Mr. Denny! The youngster nodded. He was pale and apprehensive, like the younger soldiers in the ranks. Gibbons chuckled. Best target practice the men can have. Quiet! Sharp glared at his officers. Gibbons smiled secretly. Talion! Forrest's horse edged sideways. The major calmed it. Shoulder arms! The lines of men became tipped with bayonets. There was silence. The prisoners wore trousers and shirts, no jackets and Sharp supposed them to be half full of rough brandy or rum. A chaplain walked with them, the mumble of his words just carrying to Sharp, but the prisoners seemed to take no notice of him as they were marched to the trees. The drama moved inexorably forward. Moss and Ibbotson were tied to the trunks, blindfolded, and Forrest stood the firing squad to attention. Ibbotson, the son of the vicarage, was nearest to Sharp, and he could see the man's lips moving frenetically. Was he praying? Sharp could not hear the words. Forrest gave no commands. The firing party had been rehearsed to obey signals rather than orders, and they presented and aimed to jerks of the Major's sword. Suddenly Ibbotson's voice came clear and loud. The educated tones filled with desperation, and Sharp recognised the words. We have heard and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. Forrest dropped the sword, 
the muskets banged, the bodies jerked maniacally, and a flock of birds burst screeching from the branches. Two lieutenants ran forward with drawn pistols, but the musket balls had done their work and the bodies hung with crushed and bloodied chests in front of the lingering white musket smoke. A murmur, barely audible, went through the ranks of the battalion. Sharp turned on his men. Quiet! The light company stood silent. The smoke from the firing party smelt pungent in the air. The murmur became louder. Officers and sergeants screamed orders, but the men of the South Essex had found their protest and the humming became more insistent. Sharp kept his own company quiet by sheer force, by standing glaring at them with drawn sword. But he could do nothing about the contempt that they showed on their faces. It was not aimed at him, it was for Simerson, and the colonel twitched his reins in the centre of the square and bellowed for silence. The noise increased. Sergeants ran into the ranks and struck at men they suspected of making any sound. Officers screamed at companies, adding to the din, and from beyond the battalion came the jeers of the British soldiers from the other units who had drifted out of the town to watch the execution. Gradually the moaning and humming died away, as slowly as the executioner's smoke thinned into the air and the battalion stood silent and motionless. Daddy Hill had not moved or spoken, but now he motioned to his aides de camp, and the small group trotted delicately away past the firing squad who now lifted the bodies into the coffins and off towards Oropesa. Hill's face was expressionless. Sharp had never met Daddy Hill, but he knew, as did the rest of the army, that the general had a reputation as a kind and considerate officer, and Sharp wondered what he thought of Simerson and his methods. Roland Hill commanded six battalions, but Sharp was certain none would offer him as many problems as the South Essex. Simerson rode his horse to the graves, wrenched the beast round and stood in his stirrups. His face was suffused with blood, his rage obvious and throbbing, his voice shrill in the silence. There will be a parade for punishment at six o'clock this evening, full equipment. You will pay for that display. The men stood silent. Simerson lowered his rump onto the saddle. Major Forrest, carry on. Company by company, the battalion marched past the open coffins, and the men were made to stare at the mangled bodies waiting by their graves. There, said the army, is what will happen to you if you run away, and more than that, because the names of the dead man would be sent home to be posted on their parish notice boards, so that shame could descend on their families as well. The companies marched past in silence. When the battalion was gone and the other spectators had gawped at the remains, a working party lowered the coffins into the graves. Earth was shoveled into the holes, the grass turves carefully replaced, so that to a casual eye there were no visible signs of the burials. They were deliberately left unmarked, the final insult. But when all the soldiers had gone, Spanish peasants found the graves and hammered wooden crosses into the turf. It was no measure of respect, just a precaution of sensible men. The dead were Protestants buried in unhallowed ground, and the crude crosses were there to keep the unquiet spirits firmly underground. The people of Spain had enough problems with the war. The armies of France, Spain, and now Britain crossed and recrossed their land. There was little a peasant could do about that, or about the men who fought the guerrilla, the little war. But the ghosts of heathen Englishmen were another matter. Who needed them to scare the cattle and stalk the fields by night? They hammered the crosses deep and slept easy. Chapter 15 One man in ten was to be flogged. Sixty men from the battalion, six from each company, the captain of each company to deliver his six men stripped to the waist, ready to be tied to the flogging triangles that Simerson was having made by local carpenters. The colonel had made his announcement, and then he glared with his small red eyes round the assembled officers. Were there any comments? Sharp took a breath to say anything was useless, to say nothing was cowardly. I think it a bad idea, sir. Captain Sharp thinks it a bad idea. Simerson dripped acid with every word. Captain Sharp, gentlemen, can tell us how to command men. Why, is it a bad idea, Captain Sharp? To shoot two men in the morning and flog sixty in the afternoon seems to me to be doing the work of the French for them, sir. You do? 
Well, damn you, Sharp, and damn your ideas. If the discipline in this battalion was as strictly enforced by the captains as I demand, then this punishment would not be necessary. I will have them flogged, and that includes your precious riflemen, Sharp. I expect three of them in your six. There'll be no favoritism. There was nothing to be said or done. The captains told their companies and, like Sharp, cut straws and drew lots to determine who should be Simerson's victims. Three dozen strokes each for sixty men. By two o'clock the victims were scrounging for spirits that might dull their flesh, and their sullen companions began the long afternoon of cleaning and polishing their kit for Simerson's inspection. Sharp left them to their work and went back to the house that served as the battalion's headquarters. There was trouble in the air, a mood reminiscent of the heaviness before a thunderstorm. Sharp's happiness of the morning was replaced by apprehension, and he found himself wondering what might happen before he went back to the house where Josefina waited for him and dreamed of Madrid. He spent the afternoon laboriously filling in the company books. Each month, the day book had to be copied into the ledger, and the ledger was due for Simerson's inspection in a week. He found ink, sharpened a quill, and with his tongue between his teeth began writing the details. He could have delegated the job to the sergeant who looked after the books, but he preferred to do the job himself, and then no one could accuse the sergeant of favoritism. To Thomas Cressica, private, was debited the cost of one new shoe brush, fivepence. Sharp sighed. The entry in the columns hid some small tragedy. Cressica had hurled the brush at his wife, and the wooden back had split against a stone wall. Sergeant McGiven had seen it happen and reported the man, and so, on top of his marital troubles, Thomas Cressica would now lose fivepence from a day's pay of twelvepence. The next entry in the small day book that lived in Sharp's pocket was for a pair of shoes for Jedidah Horrell. Sharp hesitated. Horrell claimed the shoes had been stolen, and Sharp was inclined to believe him. Horrell was a good man, a sturdy labourer from the Midlands, and Sharp always found his musket cared for and his equipment orderly. And Horrell had already been punished. For two days he'd marched in borrowed boots and his feet were blistered and burst. Sharp crossed the entry from his daybook and wrote in the ledger, Lost in action. He'd saved Private Horrell six shillings and sixpence. He drew the accoutrement book towards him and laboriously copied the information from the ledger into the book. He was amused to see that Lennox had already described every man in the company as having lost a stock in action. So officially the stocks, like Horrell's boots, were now a charge on the government, rather than on the individual who had lost them. For an hour he kept copying from daybook to ledger to accoutrement book, the small change of daily soldiering. When he'd finished, he drew the mess book towards him. This was easier. Sergeant Reed, who kept the books, had already crossed out the names of the men who had died at Val de la Casa and written in the new names, Sharp's riflemen and the six men who had been drafted into the light company when Wellesley made them the new battalion of detachments. Against each of the names, Sharp wrote the figure three shillings and sixpence, the sum that was debited each week for the cost of their food. It was unfair, he knew, because the men were already on half rations, and the word was that the supply situation was worsening. The commissary officers were scouring the Tagus Valley. There were frequent clashes between British and French patrols to decide which side could search a village for hidden food. There were even battles between the British and their Spanish allies who had failed to deliver a hundredth part of the supplies they'd promised. Yet they daily drove in herds of pigs, sheep, cattle or goats for their own men but it was not in Sharp's power to reduce the amount the men paid, even if the rations were not delivered in full. Instead, he noted at the bottom of the page that the sum was double the food delivered and hoped that he would be ordered to redress the balance later. In the next column, he wrote fourpence in each line, the cost of having the men's clothes washed by the wives on the strength. A man's washing cost him seventeen shillings and fourpence a year, his rations over eight pounds. Each private earned a shilling a day, seventeen pounds and sixteen shillings a year, but by the time he'd been deducted for food, for washing, for pipe clay and black ball, for soling and healing, and the one day's pay each year that went to the military hospitals at Chelsea and Kilmainham, each man was left with the three sevens, seven pounds, seven shillings and seven pence. 
and Sharp knew from bitter experience that they were lucky to get even that. Most men lost further sums to replace missing equipment, and the truth was that each private was paid about fourpence halfpenny a day to fight the French. As a captain, Sharp received ten shillings and sixpence a day. It seemed like a fortune, but more than half was deducted for his food, and then the officers' mess demanded a further levy of two shillings and eightpence a day to pay for wine, luxury foods, and the mess servants. He paid more for cleaning, for the hospitals, and he knew the sums backwards. They simply did not add up. And now Josefina was looking to him for money. Hogan had lent him money and added to the contents of his leather bag. He had enough for the next fortnight, but after that? His only hope was to find a rich corpse on the battlefield. A very rich corpse. Sharp finished with the books, shut them, laid the quill on the table and yawned as a clock in the town struck four. He opened the weekly mess book again and looked down at the names, wondering morbidly how many would still be there in a week's time, and how many would have the word deceased entered against them. Would his name be crossed out? Would some other officer look at the ledger and wonder who had written fivepence, one shoe brush, against the name Thomas Cressica? He shut the books again. It was all academic. The army had not been paid for a month, and even then they had not been paid up to date. He would give the books to Sergeant Reed, who would store them on the company mule, and when, and if, the pay arrived, Reed would make the deductions from the books and pay the men their handful of coins. There was a knock on the door. Oh, is it? Me, sir. It was Harper's voice. Come in. Harper's face was bleak, his manner formal. Well, Sergeant? Trouble, sir. Bad. The men are refusing to parade. Sharp remembered his apprehension. Which men? Whole bloody battalion, sir. Even our lads have joined in. When Patrick Harper spoke of our lads, he meant the riflemen. Sharp stood up and slung on the big sword. Who knows about this? Colonel does, sir. Men sent him a letter. Sharp swore under his breath. They sent him a letter. Who signed it? Harper shook his head. No one signed it, sir. It just tells him that they won't parade and if he comes near it, they'll blow his bloody head off. Sharp picked up the rifle. There was a word for what was happening, and the word was mutiny. Simerson's flogging of one man in ten could easily change into decimation, and instead of being flogged, the men would be stood against the trees and shot. He looked at Harper. What's happening? A lot of talk, sir. They're barricading themselves in the timber yard. All of them? Harper shook his head. No, sir. There's a couple of hundred still in the orchard. Your company's there, sir, but the lads in the yard are trying to persuade them to join in. Sharp nodded. The battalion had been bivouacked in an olive grove, which the men called an orchard, simply because the trees were laid out in neat rows. The grove was behind a timber yard, a walled yard with just one entrance. Who delivered the letter? Don't know, sir. It was pushed under the door of Simerson's house. Sharp hurried out of the door. The courtyard of the house was shadowed and silent. Most officers were taking the chance of looking at the town before they marched the next day to meet the French. Are there any officers at the timber yard? No, sir. What about the sergeants? Harper's face was expressionless. Sharp guessed that many of the sergeants were sympathetic to the protest, but, like the big Irishman, knew better than the men what the result would be if the battalion refused to parade. Wait here. Sharp ran back into the house. The rooms lay cool and empty. A woman looked at him from the kitchen, a string of peppers held in her hand, and quickly shut the door when she saw his face. Sharp took the stairs two at a time and threw open the door of the room where the light company's junior officers were quartered. Ensign Denny was the only occupant, and the sixteen-year-old was lying fast asleep on a straw mattress. Denny! The boy came awake, frightened. Sir! Where's Knowles? Don't know, sir. In town, I think. Sharp thought for a second. The boy stared wide-eyed from the mattress. Sharp's hand gripped and re-gripped the sword hilt. Join me in the courtyard as soon as you're dressed. Hurry. Harper was waiting in the street where the heat of the sun had seared the stone so that Sharp could feel the burning even through the soles of his boots. Sergeant, I want the light company on parade in five minutes in the track behind the orchard. Full kit. 
The sergeant opened his mouth to ask a question, saw the look on Sharp's face and threw a salute instead. He strode off. Denny came out of the courtyard, buckling on his sword, which trailed on the stones beside him. He looked apprehensive as Sharp turned to him. Listen carefully. You are to find out for me where Colonel Simerson is and what he's doing. Understand? The boy nodded. And you're not to let him know that's what you're doing. Try the castle, then come and find me. I'll either be on the track beside the orchard or on the square in front of the timber yard. If I'm not in either place, then find Sergeant Harper and wait with him. Understand? Denny nodded again. Repeat it to me. The boy went through his instructions. He desperately wanted to ask Sharp what the excitement was about, but dared not. Sharp nodded when he finished. One more thing, Christopher. He deliberately used Denny's Christian name to give the lad reassurance. You are not, in any circumstance, to go in the timber yard. Now, be off. If you see Lieutenant Knowles, or Major Forrest, or Captain Leroy, ask them if they'll join me. Hurry. Denny clutched his sword and ran off. Sharp liked him. One day he would make a good officer. If he was not first spitted on the bayonet of a French grenadier. Sharp turned down the hill towards the timber yard and the billets of the men. There was only one chance of averting a disaster, and that was to get the battalion on parade as soon as possible, before Simerson had time to react to the threat of mutiny. There was a clatter of hooves behind him, and he turned to see a rider waving at him. It was Captain Sterrett, the officer of the day, and he looked understandably nervous. Sharp! Sterrett! Sterrett pulled up his horse. There's an officer's call at the castle now. Everyone, what's happening? Sterrett looked frantically round the deserted street as though someone might overhear the further disaster that had overtaken Simerson's battalion. Sharp had hardly seen Sterrett since the fight at the bridge. The man was patently frightened of Simerson, of the men, of Sharp, of everyone and deliberately made himself insignificant so as to escape notice. He sketched in the events at the timber yard. Sharp interrupted him. I know about that. What's happening at the castle? The colonel's asked to see General Hill. There was still time. He looked up at the frightened captain. Listen, you haven't seen me. Understand, Sterrett? You have not seen me. But no buts. Do you want to see those sixty men shot? Sterrett's mouth dropped open. He looked round the street again and back to Sharp. The Colonel's orders are that no one is to go near the timber yard. You haven't seen me, so how could I have heard the order? Oh. Sterrett did not know how to react. He watched Sharp go on down the street and wished again that he'd been born four years earlier. Then he would have been the eldest and would now be a gentleman farmer. As it was, he felt like a rag doll swept away in a flood. He turned sadly away towards the castle and wondered what would become of it all. In front of the timber yard was a huge open space like an English village green, except that the grass here was bleached yellow and grew thinly on the shallow soil. The space was used for a weekly market, but today it was a football ground for soldiers from a dozen battalions. Sharp could see troops from the 48th, the 29th, and a company of Royal American Rifles whose green jackets reminded him of happier days. The men cheered and jeered the players. Soon, thought Sharp, they would have a more interesting spectacle to watch. He turned left beside the wall of the timber yard and down towards the orchard. No one was on the track as he'd expected, but as he drew nearer he shouted for Harper and was rewarded by hearing a flurry of commands as the light company sergeants ordered the men onto the track. He assumed the men would be reluctant to parade, but doubted if they would dare oppose him, and he stopped and watched as Harper paraded the company in four ranks. Company on parade, sir. Thank you, Sergeant. Sharp walked to the front of the company, his back to the trees and to the crowd of spectators drawn from the battalion's women, mixed with men from the other companies who had come over the wall from the yard. We're going on parade early. They didn't move. Their eyes stared rigidly in front of them. The six men detailed for punishment. One step forward. There was a fractional hesitation. The six men, three riflemen and three men from the original light company, looked left and right, but took the pace. There was a murmur in the ranks. Quiet! The men went silent, but from behind, from the orchard, a group of women began shouting insults and encouraging their men not to give up the protest. 
Sharp spun round. Hold your tongues, women can be flogged too. He marched the company to the market square and moved the footballers reluctantly from the thin turf. The six men to be flogged stood in the front rank, wearing only their trousers and shirts. They went, easily enough. Sharp could tell from their faces that they were relieved that he'd taken them over and forced them onto parade. Whatever hot words had been spoken in the burning Spanish afternoon, Sharp knew that no man really wanted to go through the hopeless business of taking on the full authority of the army. That sounded simple, he thought, and now he had to persuade nine other companies. He walked close to the six men in the front rank and looked hard at them. I know it's unfair. He spoke quietly. You didn't make the noise this morning. He stopped. He was not sure what he wanted to say, and to go further would be to sound too sympathetic to their protest. Gattaca, one of the unlucky riflemen, grinned cheerfully. It's all right, sir, it's not your fault. And we've bribed the drummer boys. Sharp smiled back. The bribe would be of little use. Simerson would make sure of that. But he was grateful for Gattaca's words. He stepped back five paces and raised his voice. Wait here. If any man moves, he'll replace one of these six men. He walked over the turf towards the double gates of the timber yard. He'd never really worried about his own men, knew that they would follow him. But as he paced towards the shut gates, he wondered what trouble was brewing inside. And, more importantly, what trouble was being brewed behind the slab-like walls of the castle. He felt for his sword hilt and walked on. Chapter 16 Sir! Captain! Sir! Ensign Denny was running towards him, sword trailing his face, streaming with sweat. Sir? What did you find out? Colonel's at the castle, sir. I think he's with the general. I met Captain Leroy and Major Forrest. Captain Leroy asked you to wait for him. Over Denny's shoulder, Sharp saw Leroy on his horse, coming from the steep streets that led to the castle. The American, thank God, was not hurrying. He walked his horse as though there were no emergency. If the men in the timber yard saw panic and worry among the officers, they would think they were winning and merely become more obstinate. Leroy's horse almost sauntered the last few yards. The American nodded at Sharp, took his hands off the reins, and lit a long black cheroot. Sharp! Sharp grinned. Leroy! Leroy slid off the horse and looked at Denny. You ride a horse, young man? Oh, yes, sir. Well, climb up on that one and keep her quiet for me. Here you are. Leroy cupped his hands and heaved the ensign into the saddle. Wait for us at the company, Sharp said. Denny rode away. Leroy turned to Sharp. There's bloody panic upstairs. Simerson's turned green and is shrieking for the artillery. Daddy Hill's telling him to calm down. You were up there? Leroy nodded. Matt Sterrett, he's giving birth to kittens, thinks it's all his fault because he's officer of the day. Simerson's screaming mutiny, what's happening? They walked on towards the timber yard. Sharp refused the offer of a cheroot. They've said they won't go on parade, but no one's actually ordered them to yet. My lads went easy enough. As I see it, we've got to get the rest out there fast. Leroy blew a thin stream of smoke into the air. Simerson's getting the cavalry. What? Daddy didn't have much choice, did he? Colonel comes to him and says the troops are mutineers, so the generals ordered the KGL down here. There'll be some time, though they weren't even saddled up. The King's German Legion. They were the best cavalry in Wellesley's army. Fast, efficient, brave and a good choice to break up a mutiny. Sharp dreaded the thought of the German horsemen clearing out the timber yard with their sabres. Where's Forrest? Leroy gestured at the castle. He's coming down here. He went to look for the sergeant major. I don't think he'll wait for Sir Henry and his heavies. Leroy grinned. They were at the gates, which were ajar. Harper had spoken of barricades, but Sharp could see none. Leroy gestured to him. Go ahead, Sharp. I'll let you do the talking. They think you're some kind of a bloody miracle worker. 
His first impression was of a yard full of men lying, standing, sitting, their weapons piled, their jackets and equipment discarded. There was a fire burning in the centre of the yard which struck him as odd because of the heat of the day, and then he remembered the extra triangles which Simerson had ordered for the mass flogging. The colonel must have ordered the work done at this yard, and the men had burned the timber which had been crudely nailed together ready for the punishments. There was a momentary hush as the two officers came through the gate, followed by a buzz of excited talk. Leroy leaned against the entrance. Sharp walked slowly through the groups of men, heading for the fire, which seemed to be the focus of the yard. The men were drinking, some already drunk, and as Sharp walked slowly through the muttered comments and hostile looks, a man ironically offered him a bottle. Sharp ignored it, knocked the man's arm with his knee as he walked past and heard the bottle break on the ground. He came to the space in front of the fire, and as he turned to face the bulk of the men, the muttering died down. He guessed there was not much fight in them. No ringleader had protested. There'd only been sullen muttering. Sergeants! No one moved. There had to be sergeants in the yard. He shouted again. Sergeants! On the double! Here! Still, no one moved. But in the corner of his eye, he had the impression of a group of men in shirts and trousers stir uneasily. He pointed at them. Come on, hurry, put your equipment on. They hesitated. For a moment he wondered if the sergeants were the ringleaders, but then realized that they were probably afraid of the men. But they picked up jackets and belts. There was some shouting at them, but no one made a move to stop them. Sharp began to relax. No! A man stood up to the left. There was a hush. All movement stopped. The sergeants looked at the man who had spoken. He was a big man with an intelligent face. He turned to the men in the yard and spoke in a reasonable voice. We are not going. We decided that and we must keep to it. His voice, like the dead Ibbotson's, was educated. He turned to Sharp. The sergeants can go, sir, but we're not. It isn't fair. Sharp ignored him. This was not the time to discuss whether Simerson's discipline was fair or unfair. Discipline at moments like this was not open to discussion. It existed, and that was that. He turned back to the sergeants. Come on, move yourselves. The sergeants, a dozen of them, came sheepishly to the fire. Sharp was suddenly aware of the scorching heat of the blaze, added to the sun it was breaking his back into a prickly sweat. The sergeant shuffled to a halt. Sharp spoke loudly. You've got two minutes. I want everyone on parade in this yard properly dressed. The men to be flogged wearing shirts and trousers only. Grenadier company by the gate, the rest formed on them. Move. They hesitated. Sharp took a step towards them, and they suddenly snapped into action. He turned and walked into the crowded men. On your feet, you're on parade. Hurry up. The burly man tried one last protest and Sharp whipped round on him. You want more bloody executions? Move! It was all over. Some of the drunker men needed kicking onto their feet, but the little fight had gone out of them. Leroy joined Sharp and, with the sergeants, they dressed the companies. The men looked a mess. Their uniforms were unbrushed, spotted with sawdust, their belts stained and muskets dirty. Some of the men were pale with drink. Sharp had rarely seen a battalion in worse parade order, but that was better than a mutinous rabble being chased by the efficient German cavalry. Leroy swung open the gates, Sharp gave the order, and the battalion marched out in formation to line up on the light company. Forrest was outside. His mouth dropped as the first company emerged. He had a handful of officers and other sergeants with him, and they ran to their companies and shouted orders. The battalion began to march crisply. The sergeant major hammered them into place, stood them at ease, stood the ranks easy. Sharp marched up to Forrest's horse, snapped to attention, and saluted. Battalion on parade, sir! Forrest looked down at him. What happened? Happened, sir? Nothing. But I was told they refused to parade. Sharp pointed at the battalion. 
The men were pulling their uniforms into shape, brushing the worst dirt off their jackets, punching their shakos into shape. Forrest stared at them and back to Sharp. He's not going to like this. And the colonel, sir? Forrest grinned. He's coming here with the cavalry, Sharp, and General Hill. Forrest checked his grin. It was unseemly, but Sharp understood his amusement. Simerson would be furious. He disturbed a general, roused a regiment of cavalry, and all for a mutiny that had not happened. The thought pleased Sharp. The battalion stood in the heat. The bells in the town marked five o'clock and quarter past. They dusted their uniforms as well as they could. Perhaps half the officers were present. They dribbled in from the town, but the rest were with Simerson. As the clock struck the half hour, there was the thunder of hooves, a cloud of dust, and in a display of force calculated to demoralize the supposedly mutinying troops, the blue uniformed dragoons of the King's German Legion galloped onto the market square. They were splendidly turned out in their blue jackets, fur trimmed pelisses, and on their heads, brown fur callbacks. Their sabres were drawn, and they rode straight for the timber yard. Slowly it dawned on them that it was empty, and that the heads they'd been sent to break were on parade. Orders were shouted, horses turned, the cavalry subsided into an embarrassed silence, and watched the gaggle of red-coated horsemen follow them onto the marketplace. Colonel Sir Henry Simerson with Major General Roland Hill, aides de camp, officers of the battalion like Gibbons and Berry, and behind them a gaggle of other mounted officers who had come to see the excitement. They all stopped and stared. Simerson peered into the timber yard, looked back at the parade, and then once more into the yard. The sergeant major took his cue from Forrest. Talion! Shun! The battalion of detachments snapped to attention. The sergeant major filled his chest. Talion! Shoulder! Umps! The three movements were perfectly timed. There was only the sound of six hundred palms slapping six hundred muskets in unison. Talion will make the general salute! There was a general present. Present! Up! Sharp swept his sword into the salute. Behind him the companies slammed the ground with their feet, the muskets dipped in glorious precision, the parade quivered with pride. Daddy Hill saluted back. The sergeant major shouldered the battalion's arms, ordered them, and stood the men at ease. Sharp watched Forrest ride his horse to Simerson and salute. He could see gesticulations, but could hear nothing. Hill seemed to be asking the questions, and Sharp saw Forrest turn in his saddle and point in the direction of the light company. The pointed arm turned into a beckoning one. Captain Sharp! Sharp marched across the parade ground as though he were the regimental sergeant major on a royal parade. Damn Simerson. He might as well have his face rubbed in the dirt. He cracked to a halt, saluted, and waited. Hill looked down on him, his round face shadowed by his large cocked hat. Captain Sharp? Sir, you paraded the battalion. Is that correct? Sir? Sharp had learned as a sergeant that repeating the word sir with enough force and precision could get a man through most meetings with senior officers. Hill realized it too. He looked at his watch and then back at Sharp. The parade is thirty minutes early. Why? The men seem bored, sir. I thought some drill would do them good, so Captain Leroy and myself brought them out. Hill smiled. He liked the answer. He looked at the ranks standing immobile in the sunlight. Tell me, Captain, did anyone refuse to parade? Refuse, sir? Sharp sounded surprised. No, sir. Hill looked at him keenly. Not one man, Captain? No, sir, not one man. Sharp dared not look at Simerson. Once more the colonel was looking foolish. He had cried mutiny to a general of division only to find that a junior captain had paraded the men. Sharp sensed Simerson shifting uneasily on his saddle as Hill looked down shrewdly. You surprise me, Captain. Surprise, sir? Hill smiled. He had dealt with enough sergeants in his life to know the game Sharp was playing. Yes, Captain. 
You see, your colonel received a letter saying that the men were refusing to parade. That's called mutiny. Sharp turned innocent eyes on Simerson. A letter, sir? Refusing to parade? Simerson glared at him. He would have killed Sharp on the spot if he dared. Sharp looked back to Hill and let his expression change from innocent surprise to slow dawning of awareness. I think that must be a prank, sir. You know how playful the lads get when they're ready for battle. Hill laughed. He'd been beaten by enough sergeants to know when to stop playing the game. Good. Well, what's it to do about nothing? Today seems to be the South Essex's day. This is the second parade I've attended in twelve hours. I think it's time I inspected your men, Sir Henry. Simerson said nothing. Hill turned back to Sharp. Thank you, Captain. Ninety-fifth, eh? Yes, sir. I've heard of you, haven't I? Sharp. Let me think. He peered down at the rifleman, then snapped his fingers. Of course. I'm honoured to make your acquaintance, Sharp. Did you know the rifles are on their way back? Sharp felt his heart leap in excitement. Here, sir. They might even be in Lisbon by now. Can't manage without the rifles, eh, Simerson? There was no reply. Which battalion are you, Sharp? Second, sir. Oh, you'll be disappointed, then. The first are coming. Still, it'll be good to see old friends again, eh? Yes, sir. Hill seemed genuinely happy to be chatting away. Over the general's shoulder, Sharp caught a glimpse of Gibbons sitting disconsolate on his horse. The general slapped away a fly. What do they say about the rifles, eh, Captain? First on the field, and last off it, sir. Hill nodded. That's the spirit. So you're attached to the South Essex, are you? Yes, sir. Well, I'm glad you're in my division, Sharp. Very glad. Carry on. Thank you, sir. He saluted, about turned, and marched back towards the light company. As he went, he heard Hill call out to the cavalry's commanding officer, You can go home. No business today. The general walked his horse down the ranks of the battalion and talked affably with the men. Sharp had heard much about Daddy Hill and understood now why he'd been given the nickname. The general had the knack of making every man think that he was cared for. Seemed genuinely concerned about them, wanted them to be happy. There was no way in which he could not have seen the state of the battalion. Even allowing for three weeks' marching and the fight at the bridge, the men looked hastily turned out and sloppily dressed. But Hill turned a blind eye. When he reached the light company, he nodded familiarly to Sharp, joked about Harper's height, made the men laugh. He left the company grinning and rode with Simerson and his entourage to the centre of the parade ground. You've been bad lads. I was disappointed in you this morning. He spoke slowly and distinctly so that the flank companies, like Sharps, could hear him clearly. You deserve the punishment that Sir Henry ordered. He paused. But really you've done very well this afternoon. Early on parade. There was a rustle of laughter in the ranks. You seem very keen to get your punishment. The laughter died. Well, you're going to be disappointed. Because of your behaviour this afternoon, Sir Henry has asked me to cancel the punishment parade. I don't think I agree with him, but I'm going to let him have his way. So, there will be no floggings. There was a sigh of relief. Hill took another deep breath. Tomorrow we march with our Spanish allies towards the French. We're going to Talavera and there's going to be a battle. I'm proud to have you in my division. Together we're going to show the French just what being a soldier means. He waved a benign hand at them. Good luck, lads. Good luck. They cheered him till they were hoarse took off their shakos and waved them at the general who beamed back at them like an indulgent parent. When the noise died down, he turned to Simerson. Dismiss them, Colonel. Dismiss them. They've done well. Simerson had no alternative but to obey. The parade was dismissed. The men streamed off the field in a buzz of talk and laughter. Hill trotted back towards the castle, and Sharp watched Simerson and his group of officers ride after him. 
The man had been made to look foolish, and he, sharp, would be blamed. The tall rifleman walked slowly back towards the town, head down to discourage conversation. It was true that he'd enjoyed discomforting Simerson, but the colonel had asked for the treatment. He'd not even bothered to check whether the men would refuse an order. He had simply screamed for the cavalry. Sharp knew he had heaped too many insults on the colonel and his nephew. Sharp doubted now that Simerson would be content with the letter that would be in Lisbon by now, waiting for a ship and a fair wind to carry the mail to London. The letter would blight Sharp's career, and unless he could perform a miracle in the battle that was coming nearer by the hour, then Simerson would have the satisfaction of seeing Sharp broken. But there was more to it now. There was honour and pride and a woman. He doubted if Gibbons would seek an honourable solution. He doubted if the lieutenant would be satisfied by the letter his uncle had written, and he felt a shiver of apprehension at what might happen. The girl would be Gibbons' target. A man ran up behind him. Sir! Sharp turned. It was the burly man who had tried to stop the battalion parading in the timber yard. Yes? I wanted to thank you, sir. Thank me? For what? Sharp spoke harshly. The man was embarrassed. We would have been shot, sir. I would happily have given the order myself. Then thank you, sir. Sharp was impressed. The man could have kept silent. What's your name? Huckfield, sir. He was educated and Sharp was curious. Where'd you get your education, Huckfield? I was a clerk, sir, in a foundry. A foundry? Yes, sir, in Shropshire. We made iron, sir, all day and night. It was a valley of fire and smoke. I thought this might be more interesting. You volunteered? Sharp's astonishment showed in his voice. Huckfield grinned. Yes, sir. Disappointed? Well, the air's cleaner, sir. Sharp stared at him. He had heard men talk of the new industry that was springing up in Britain. They had described, like Huckfield, whole landscapes that were bricked over and dotted with the giant furnaces producing iron and steel. He had heard stories of bridges thrown over rivers, bridges made entirely of metal, of boats and engines that worked from steam, but he'd seen none of these things. One night round a campfire, someone had said that it was the future and that the days of men on foot and on horseback were numbered. That was fantasy, of course, but here was Huckfield who had seen these things and the image of a country given over to great black machines with bellies of fire made Sharp feel uncertain. He nodded to the man. I forget this afternoon, Huckfield. Nothing happened. He ignored the man's thanks. Being uncertain of the future was the price a soldier paid. Sharp could not imagine being in an army that was not at war. He could not imagine what he might do if there was suddenly a peace and he had no job. But before then, there was a battle to fight, and an eagle to win, and a girl to fight for. He climbed up into the streets of Oropesa. Chapter 17 in sixteen years' soldiering, Sharp had really felt such certainty the battle was about to be joined. The Spanish and British armies had combined at Oropesa and marched on to Talavera, 21,000 British and 34,000 Spanish, a vast army swollen by mules, servants, wives, children, priests, pouring eastwards to where the mountains almost met the River Tagus and the vast arid plain ended at the town of Talavera. The wheels of one hundred and ten field guns ground the white roads to fine dust. The hooves of over six thousand cavalry stirred the powder into the air, where it clung to the infantry who trudged through the heat and listened to the far-off crackle as the leading Spanish skirmishers pushed aside the screen of French light troops. To left and right, Sharp could see other plumes of dust where cavalry patrols rode parallel to the line of march. Closer by, in the fields, the battalion saw small groups of Spanish soldiers who had fallen out of the march and now lay, apparently unconcerned, chatting with their women, smoking, watching the long columns of British infantry file past. The men were hungry, hard as well as they tried, thorough as the commissary could be, 
Nevertheless, there was simply not enough food for the whole army. The area between Oropesa and Talavera had already been scoured by the French. Now it was searched by Spanish and British. And the battalion had only eaten Tommy's pancakes made from flour and water since they left Oropesa the day before. It was a time for tightening belts, but the prospect of action had raised men's spirits, and when the battalion marched past the bodies of three French skirmishers, they forgot their hunger at their first sight of French infantry.